but it's that time of the week again, the Worldview Friday segment. And today's conversation is inspired by two articles that my colleague David Clausen wrote, both related to something the left has been working to erase and define, and that is what it means to be a woman. The articles can be found at frcblog.com, and I encourage you to check those out. But we will go ahead and discuss them right now with the author, David Clausen, FRC's director of the Center for Biblical Worldview. David, good to see you. Happy Friday. Good to be with you, Joseph. Well, interesting week in Washington, D.C. We have brilliant uh, Yale-educated attorneys, right? She went to Yale or Harvard. Which one was it? I believe it was Harvard. Harvard. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, you know, all the, all the Ivy Law School... <laughs> they kind of get jumbled up. But Harvard Law School, who's struggling to define what a woman is. And I want to get into the implications, the significance of that. But first, before we drill into that, you've been watching the confirmation hearings, the questions, her responses, people's responses to her questions and responses. What have you learned from watching the confirmation this week? Yeah, watching the confirmation hearings this week, I think it's just really interesting. I hope a lot of Americans did it. It's really an example of... Uh, the way our, our government works. It's a good uh, a civics lesson. You know, the Constitution says that the Senate shall give advice and consent to the president's uh, picks to be on the Supreme Court, the highest court in our nation. And that's what took place, uh, Joseph, the last uh, four days in the Senate Judiciary Committee. You had Republican and uh, Democrat senators asking Judge Jackson Brown, or Judge Brown Jackson, uh, questions about her judicial philosophy. And I think it was just a really, it, it was interesting to hear her uh, answer some questions straightforwardly, kind of dodge on some questions about what her actual judicial philosophy is, kind of get a little defensive uh, when she was asked by Senator Hawley or Senator Cruz about uh, decisions she made when she was sentencing those who were caught with child pornography. Uh, so I think it was very interesting. I think you see a real worldview, worldview divide, uh, even just in the questions uh, senators were asking based on what political party they were a part of. Yeah, you definitely see worldview divides, and we're going to get into that. You also see partisan divides. One other issue I kind of wanted to bring up, because I think it's it's uh, it's important as we think about just kind of the process that we're involved with. Uh, Senator Ben Sass, he had some comments suggesting that both the Supreme Court and the Senate, kind of the, the influence that cameras have on the process, and basically saying that the presence of cameras makes people perform for the cameras. And he implied that, you know, it discouraged people from apologizing or being gracious because they thought that might be a political liability. What's your thought on the idea that all of these cameras end up having the people involved in the process performing for the public rather than trying to just be decent and perform a public service? I agree with Senator Sass. I think if you you know go back and look at the confirmation hearings uh, for the uh, picks that President Trump made, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, it was clear that you had uh, senators on the Democratic aisle, uh, Senator Booker, Senator Harris, uh, who at the time were running for president during the Kavanaugh hearings. And I think it was clear they were looking for that kind of gotcha moment. And I think even this week, you know, there are senators on the Republican side of the aisle who probably have presidential uh, aspirations. And I think at some points they probably as well were looking for that soundbite, to look for that viral moment. And, and so I think what Senator Sass was saying, you know, some people don't know this, Joseph, but the Supreme Court, when they have oral arguments, they do not allow cameras. Uh, you can hear the audio uh, recordings after the fact, uh, but they don't allow cameras. And so I think it's good uh, that we can hear what our lawmakers and the people that make decisions that affect us, it's good to hear what they're saying, how they're interacting with one another. But I do think uh, that we need to find a balance uh, between the, kind of the g gamesmanship and the showmanship uh, versus the actual governing of the people. And it does bring up some worldview questions about why it is that we do what we do. Do we behave, different, do we behave differently when people are watching than we would when people aren't watching, right? That's and that's the, the, the old, it's not a cliche, it's real wisdom, I think, that integrity, your integrity is defined on by what you do when no one is watching. And that has implications for just kind of our private lives. But it's interesting. And I think the reality is that when the cameras are on, when we know we have an audience, there's a real temptation to behave differently. And the question that I think we're going to basically leave unanswered here, but deserves some time is, 
Why is that? And is that a good thing or not? What's that say about our system that we generally seem to agree that the people that we've elected to office are behaving differently publicly than they would privately? But I want to drill down into some of these questions. We talked about kind of the political theater that is involved, and I think that's real. And one of the questions, and was it a gotcha question or was it a legitimate question? It's gotten a lot of attention. Let's go ahead and play this uh, with just with Senator Blackburn's conversation with Justice Jackson. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. David Clawson, what's your reaction to that? Fair question or not? I think it's a very fair question. I don't think that's a gotcha question. I think that it is that exchange right there. I hope every American sees it. It's a very revealing question that it has to be asked. But Joseph, I think it's an even more revealing non-answer. Uh, the fact that Judge Jackson uh, you know, did not want to answer that question. People should go back and watch you know, these confirmation hearings. It's clear. Uh, no one should doubt the fact that Judge uh, Jackson uh, is brilliant. Uh, she answered many of these complicated legal questions with ease. Uh, but the truth is she's actually embarrassed, Joseph, uh, by the question that Senator Blackburn answer, or the, uh, asked her uh, because uh, the Democrat Party, uh, the Democrat base, their worldview, they're, they're now, so, now so captive uh, by the far left of the party that their answer to that question is embarrassing. And I think it's the reason, Joseph, I think it's a fair question to ask is because Judge Jackson was sitting in that chair in the confirmation hearings this week in large part because of a campaign promise that then candidate Joe Biden made. Uh, Joe Biden promised to appoint a black woman uh, to the Supreme Court. And what's fascinating, Joseph, is that prior to that exchange with Senator Blackburn, uh, Judge Jackson had actually used the woman, the word woman 14 times uh, in answers to other questions uh, that she was receiving. So Judge Jackson knows the answer to that question. She's just unwilling to answer it uh, because of uh, the, really where the Democrat Party uh, is now when it comes to these contested questions of gender identity. And let's drill down on that a little bit. Why would a really intelligent person who, as you say, has used the term 14 times previously in that conversation, so she, clearly she has an idea of what this word means because she uses it often, as we all do. Why would she be uh, hesitant, reluctant, unwilling to define that term that she had been using so frequently? I think the reason, and obviously the context of this, Joseph, is what just happened a week prior to these confirmation hearings, which is when Leah Thomas, a biological male, uh, won an NCAA championship in the women's division. Uh, this is an issue that is all over the place. There was biological men in the Olympics that, that happened in Tokyo a couple of um, months prior. Uh, this is a, an issue that's taking our, our culture, our society by storm, uh, this idea, this, this transgender moral revolution. And I think the reason Judge Jackson dodged on this is because increasingly, uh, they're the, again, the uh, Democratic Party, their base, their politicians, their their donors ha have really bought in whole, uh, you know, hook, line, and sinker to the transgender worldview that posits a difference between biological sex and gender identity. Uh, essentially, the definition that a lot of Democrats and people on the left progressives are giving is that when it comes to gender, it, it's really up to the individual. Uh, now, as Christians, we have a very different answer. I'm sure we can get into kind of the Christian worldview response to this, but it's just clear uh, in that moment, it was very revealing uh, that Judge Jackson's really embarrassed uh, as far as the answer that folks in the party that nominated her to this seat would give to this question. And let's talk for a moment about why this matters for a judge. Because, of course, the, the worldview that makes that a difficult question to answer, is it, it assumes that the way you feel yeah. determines what is true. Yeah. And if she has accepted that premise, that the way you feel determines what is true, what does that mean for a judge? Because a judge's job is to interpret the law and to say, here's what the law says, here's how it applies to these facts. But what if you have a judge who believes the way you feel determines what is true? That's very dangerous territory because then suddenly the words don't actually have meaning. You have to yep. like the outcome for that to be the correct outcome. 
And it's a very dangerous territory. The difference between the rule of law and the rule of men is under the rule of law, we don't consider the outcome necessarily. We don't consider who is involved in the dispute. We just apply the law to the facts. But if you have somebody on the bench who wants to feel good about the outcome of this, who really is looking at the parties involved and they don't want to do something, they believe the way they feel about it determines what is true, the probability of them applying the law neutrally to the facts uh, becomes really questionable. But David, there was another exchange that gets to a more fundamental question in this. This had to do with, uh, well, this is a question that Senator Kennedy asked Judge Jackson. It's relevant. It's clip three. Let's play that, and then I want to get a reaction from you. When does life begin, in your opinion? Senator, um, I don't know. <laughs> Ma'am? I don't know. David Clawson, there's another moment where she struggles. So we've got, what is a woman? Super confusing. When does life begin? Super confusing uh, to her in these moments. Why is it, uh, what is it about human nature that wants to make simple things complex? Yeah, that's a great question, Joseph. And again, what a revealing moment in, in this, these you know, confirmation hearings. Let me just say again, Judge Jackson, we're not doubting her in intelligence. She's a, a brilliant, accomplished judge uh, who's done a lot in her life. She has a very compelling life story. Uh, but the fact that she is hedging and dodging on these basic questions, this is, I think, why, Joseph, we, we, having these worldview conversations is so important, important because this is underscoring the massive worldview divide uh, between uh, Americans th these days, those that come at these questions from a biblical worldview that believe in absolute truth, uh, that believe in objective truth, uh, that have an epistemology that says that we can actually know things and we can uh, say things are true, we can say things are right, we can say things are wrong, uh, versus a worldview that rejects um, uh, really a postmodern worldview uh, that rejects the uh, idea that we can actually know things, a, a postmodern worldview that says actually language is a tool of oppression that we use to exploit people. And so just on that question, Joseph, when does life begin? Biologist, embryologist, scientist, they, life begins at conception. This is not a disputed fact, but the problem is this has now become a political issue uh, that one side of the aisle has now become completely beholden to the abortion lobby uh, that Judge Jackson knows she can't answer that question and still be in the good yeah. graces of the people who appointed her to this opening on the Supreme Court. And it, it, that's a commentary on our times. Yeah. Though. David, I think there's, there's something else going on here as well. Because I think the human tendency to make simple things complex is a function of the fact that we don't like the obvious, simple answer to the question. In these cases, what is a woman? Well, that's complicated because it's challenging. When does life begin? Well, that's complicated because it's challenging. Should I remain faithful to my spouse? Well, I know what the answer is, but right now I don't feel like it. So I'm going to come up with some rationale about why this is a complicated question when it's really not a complicated question. We saw this happen uh, in Genesis with God and Cain. Hey, Cain, where's your brother Abel? Well, I don't know. That's complicated. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it even my job to answer that question, right? Simple right. answers. And, and the reason humans want to make these things complicated is because we don't like the answer and underneath this. And I think uh, there's been a lot of like laughing, maybe even mocking of Judge Jackson this week that I'd like to rein in a little bit and try to help us all understand the, the same boat that we're in with her is that when God says something that's pretty clear, there's a simple answer, but we don't like it. The tendency in all of us is to make it complicated because we don't really want to obey, do we? No, we don't, Joseph. And I think that's why as Christians, one of the things that we talk about on this show quite often is that as Christians, we do, we actually believe we're under authority. We believe there's an outside authority. We're not our own authorities. We're not our own little demigod. We believe that God is the outside authority. We believe his word sets the stage. So even a question like, what is a woman? You know, let's start with you know, an adult female. But as Christians, we can go even further and say that a woman is a uh, someone who's made in God's image, who has 
uh, XX chromosomes. Those chromosomes go all the way down uh, to the level of the cells. A, a woman is someone uh, created with uh, beauty and femininity who complements the masculinity of men, who has the uh, capacity to be a mother. Of course, not all women are going to be mothers, but they have that nurturing uh, ability, uh, that caring ability that is just woven into who they are. And I think it's just remarkable, Joseph, that when what the left is doing is we're rendering womanhood as this social construct that's demeaning and it's inviting cultural anarchy. And we just need to realize these basic questions, God has given the answer to those to us in his word. These are embedded in the order of creation. And to continue to spurn that, it's, it's really shows that this is, this is Romans 1 uh, kind of on play before our eyes when we reject the obvious of uh, what God has told us. That's exactly right. And, and let's remember, there, this, there are practical implications to this, because this isn't just, we've heard a lot about Leah Thomas and women swimming, but Practically speaking, housing situations, scholarship situations, and enrollment in women's colleges, grants for women-owned business programs. If the federal government embraces this postmodern world, this truth is however you feel, the implications of this are tremendous. So we, we laugh about it, it's important, um, but it's not funny um, because these have tremendous implications, not only for our public policy, but ultimately our understanding of truth. David Clausen, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Joseph.